Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Bridge by Ian Banks. Uh, so this was actually given to me by a friend of mine. I'll read you the blurb and then go through and check out some of my tabs. And then once I've finished reading it, I'll share my overall thoughts. Well, I will say so far, I mean, I'm only about 50 pages in at the time of reading this. But so far, it's quite um, almost psychedelic. There are like little bits of sci-fi in it. It's like a sci-fi version of uh, Alice in Wonderland for adults with a bit of a gritty feel to it, I guess. So, uh, the blurb. A man lies in a coma after a near-fatal accident. His body broken, his memory vanished. He finds himself in the surreal world of the bridge. A world free of the usual constraints of time and space. A world where dream and fantasy, past and future, fuse. Who is this man? Where is he? Is he more dead than alive? Or has he never been so alive before? So, uh, I quite liked this little section here that I'm going to read out to you. Just, I, I, the dialogue itself just made me laugh. The policeman continues to sit on top of the thin man with the dandruff. He looks away with an expression somewhere between surliness and embarrassment. Oh dear, the young receptionist says, looking desolate. I am sorry to hear that, Mr. Orr. Cup of something to cheer you up, perhaps? No thanks. I hurry through to join the doctor in his office. Dr. Joyce is examining the prioritised list lying under a paperweight on the blotter of his impressively large desk. Dr. Joyce, I say. Why is there a policeman sitting on top of a man in your outer office? He looks towards the door I have just closed. Oh, he says, going back to the type list. That's Mr. Berkeley. He has a non-specific delusion. Keeps thinking he's an article of furniture. He frowns, taps one finger on an item on the list. I sit down in an unoccupied chair. Really? Yes, what he thinks he is varies from day to day. We tell whoever's guarding him just to humour him where possible. Oh, I thought perhaps they were some sort of minimalist radical theatre group. I take it Mr. Berkeley thinks he's a seat at the moment. Dr. Joyce frowns. Don't be stupid, or You wouldn't put one seat on top of another, would you? He must think he's a cushion. Of course, I nod. Why the police guard? Oh, it can get a bit tricky. Every now and again he thinks he's a B-Day in a lady's toilet. He's not normally violent, just... Dr. Joyce stares vacantly at the pastel pink ceiling of, of his office for a moment. He gropes for the right word, then dredges down, insistent. He goes back to the list. For me, this book is re worth reading, if only for that little section. Although I have just read it out, so maybe maybe not. You might have to see what I, what I think of when I read more of it. The problem I'm having so far is it's like enjoyable to read and um, I like a, a lot of the ideas it plays with but there's not really too much to say about it yet so we'll see if that changes as it goes on. Then we get Mr. Berkeley comes back again. Uh, how about some coffee? No thanks, I say, looking at Mr. Berkeley and his policemen who are waiting in the reception area. Mr. Berkeley lies curled in a tight fetal position on his side on the floor in front of the seated policeman who is resting his feet on him. Mr. Berkeley is a footstool today, the appalling young man tells me proudly. He's probably my favourite character, and he's just a minor throwaway character, but he really entertained me throughout this book. And basically this guy is, um, I mean he's dealing with like, like amnesia and stuff, but he's going to see this doctor and he's meant to talk about his dreams, and he basically makes it up. And it's kind of funny, because that's what I do with like mental health services. I know it's really bad to say that, but you get to know the answers that they want from you, and if you've got a particular goal in mind, whether it's to get medication or CBT or whatever it is, you just lie to them. Because like in my example, if I told them like how much I drink, for example, which isn't even that much, um, I, I have to go to like uh, alcohol rehab. And it literally works out as I think, if, I, if you drink like a beer, an average of a beer a day, then that's it, you, like, you have to go to the alcohol rehab. And it's like very formulaic, you, you can't avoid doing that unless you just lie about how much you drink, you know? Um, I decided after breakfast that I would lie about my dreams. After all, if I can invent the first two, I can cover up the others. I shall tell the doctor I had no dreams last night and shall make up the one I was supposed to have had the night before. There is no point in telling him the sort of things I've really been dreaming about. Analysis is one thing, but shame is quite another. There's more manipulation than shame, really, but, you know. Uh, after another one of his uh, meetings, as I leave, Mr. Berkeley is led in by his policeman. Mr. Berkeley's breath smells of mothballs. I can only assume he thinks he is a chest of drawers. There's a kid here and his uh, parents. They always looked delighted when he answered television quiz shows questions before the contestants and were proud and a little amazed that he read two or three library books every week. Two or three, what an amateur. I quite liked um, this little passage here that I'm going to read out as well because this is similar to the way that I think and the way that I look at the world. It seems so obvious to him that he had great and genuine difficulty understanding anybody else's point of view. You know, he said, if I had my way, I wouldn't let anybody who believed in star signs or the Bible or faith healing or anything like that use electric power or ride in cars and buses and trains and aircraft or use anything made of plastic. They want to believe the universe works according to their crazy little rules. 
Okay, let them live that way. But why should they be allowed to use the fruits of sheer fucking human genius and hard work? Things produced only because people better than them once had the sense and the hope to... Will you stop laughing at me? He glared at her. She was, shaking, she was shaking with silent laughter, her pinkly quivering tongue poised to lick another paper. She turned to him, eyes glistening, and held out a hand. You're just so funny sometimes, she said. He took her hand, kissed it formally. So glad I amuse you, my dear. He didn't think he'd said anything funny. Why was she laughing at him? In the end, he had to admit, he didn't really understand her. He didn't understand women. He didn't understand men. He didn't even understand children very well. All he really understood, he thought, was himself and the rest of the universe. Neither anything like completely, of course, but both well enough to know that what remained to be discovered would make sense. It would fit in. It could all be gradually and patiently fitted together a bit at a time, like an infinite jigsaw puzzle, with no straight edges to look for and no end in sight, but one in which there was always going to be somewhere for absolutely any piece to fit. We get this little conversation here. Uh, they found out what language the planes are writing in. Yes? Braille. What? Braille. The blind language. Still complete nonsense, even when you do decipher it. But that's what it is, alright. Now, so they're talking about this piece of communication or whatever. I don't want to say exactly what, because spoilers and stuff. But what bothers me? Isn't that encryption? Because Braille isn't a language. If anything, it's like an alphabet or like a, a character system, you know? Uh, so, like, because for example, you could write in English in Braille, or you could write in Spanish in Braille. And English or Spanish would be the language. Braille would be the alphabet, or perhaps you could call it like the encoding system or something. This was just a nice little quote, because I think... I mean, I don't drive or anything like that, so I get public transport and walk. And it's very true, because I walk for fun as well, and he says here, um, I'm amazed at how much less pleasant walking becomes when it is adopted due to necessity rather than idle choice. Yeah, it, it's true. Like, when you have to get somewhere, walking becomes a hassle, as opposed to being something fun. This just made me chuckle here. Well, the patient's condition is stable. He's dead. Can't get, more, can't get much more fucking stable than that, can you? And there's this character here, and he thinks kind of how I think, I guess. He says, he even thought of suggesting they get married, but a sort of pride in him would not tolerate the idea of the state, far less the church, being appeased in this way. Exactly. Just a piece of paper anyway. This little bit here, I just enjoyed as well, because it's a music reference. Things went on. Lennon got shot, Dylan got religion. He could never decide which depressed him most. So we have a reference to the Kingdom of Fife, a small place now, but big enough then. And uh, yeah, this has got some like Scottish history behind it. I don't know all the details, but I know that Irvin Welsh has uh, written about the Kingdom of Fife as well and used that as a metaphor in, in his stories. I think this is funny as well, so this guy he has an accident. I mean, he causes it himself, but um, this is kind of like what, what I think in a way. Yeah, sure, but that was long ago. What about now? I mean, good grief, seven months without a drink or a smoke. I've probably been healthier lying here unconscious than I've been in the rest of my adult life. Not much exercise, maybe, but nothing more dangerous to ingest than whatever it is they shoved down this tube in my nose. How the hell has my body survived seven months without drinking drugs? So yeah, all in all, I guess I enjoyed this book. It's one of those things, all the Scottish dialect bits really did my head in just because I don't like the way that he writes Scottish dialect. Um, I don't mind in general when it uses it. However, the actual storyline that was happening there was, you know, pretty good. And the overall kind of concepts and stuff in this book were good. I enjoyed a lot of the themes, a lot of the questions, a lot of the dialogue in particular as well. Um, so I'm going to give it 3.5 out of 5 and I would read Ian Banks more. I can't tell you whether this is a good place to start or not because this is my first Ian Banks book. But overall I thought it was pretty good. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Bridge by Ian Banks. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.